Stanford University. Welcome to the seminar on people, computers, and design. I'm Terry Winograd. Uh, quick announcement, next week, no class. It's Thanksgiving break. Enjoy your vacation. Uh, two weeks from today will be the last class of the session. Uh, it will be Jamie Tivan from Microsoft Research uh, talking about her work on search. And uh, if you're taking the course for credit, probably it's about time now or certainly by the next time, take a look at the page. Go to the, go to the home page of the course, CS547, and take a look at the link that says Administrative Details. And you'll see what's expected in terms of the final logistics of getting credit. And we'll be sending out a reminder mail too in the, after the last class. Okay. Today we have Shwetak Patel, who's from University of Washington, and brought the rain down with him. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was hoping for the good weather, but sorry. <laughs> and I said last week, uh, <coughs> excuse me, when we were looking at sensors in a sort of home environment that we were going to have that theme for two weeks. So he's looking at the variety of inputs and in what's ubiquitous computing, his title, uh, and how to make use of those in that environment. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Terry. Um, so, uh, like Kerry said, I'm an assistant prof at UW in computer science and engineering and electrical engineering. Uh, so I have a unique appointment where I'm homed in the computer science department, but I have uh, the ability to pull students and actually have a full voting member in electrical engineering. Um, also, incidentally, I'm also a certified electrician and plumber, and hopefully that will become relevant in, a, in the next couple of slides. Um, considering how much plumbers and electricians charge, I think I'm in the wrong field at the moment. <laughs> So, so my research areas are pretty broad. Um, so our lab focuses on you know, HCI, UBComp, and, and novel UI techniques. One of the things that's really unique about the lab that I'm running at UW is that I have students that are really technical that work on the signal processing, the hardware, for enabling some of the new technologies that we're going to be building for in the future. And also looking at some of the formative work and the, the, the user-centered design of those technologies so that you can marry up the right technologies there. And so I have students that are both on the technical side that build the hardware, do the signal processing, machine learning, but also a handful of students that also are interested in the applications and figuring out how do you leverage those technologies that we're building. Um, and so today what I want to talk about is um, a little bit about how can we enable large-scale explorations of ubiquitous computing? So the general, area of, the general idea of UBComp is looking at how do we move, move away from the desktop metaphor and move into the real environment. Well, one of the challenges of ubiquitous computing is that if you want to move away from the desktop into the real world, well, how do you really enable that? You know, how do you build applications on that platform that are actually practical? So you've got to start looking at ways that you can do this at a large scale so we can start to ask better questions about how those applications are going to have impact in the future. And so large-scale deployments in the home environment actually is still a challenge. So we're not just focusing on you know, the classroom or the, or the uh, workplace, but just look at the home. I think there's a lot of unique opportunities that we can leverage in the home that we can have a profound uh, impact on people's lives. So what would it mean to enable you know, 250 million homes in the US to have ubiquitous computing technologies integrated into that environment? And so one of the things in the home is sensing activity. So activity sensing and location is still a uh, a, a fairly difficult challenge in ubiquitous computing. We've been t talking about sensing in the home for the last 10 years, but it really hasn't gotten to a point where we can really deploy these things on a large scale. And so there's a variety of different motivations for this. You know, elder care, some of the canonical applications. If you know people's activities and patterns, you can start to infer certain kinds of activities in that space. Uh, recently, there's been a lot of work in the medical community looking at studying human behavior as a way to assess outcome. To assess outcome, clinical outcomes in the home without having to, them to come to a clinic. Um, and also recently there's a resurgence in the area of energy and resource monitoring. So if you had sensors in the home, how can you give people effective feedback about consumption in their home? So there's a lot of interesting applications in this space, but we really don't have a technology that we can deploy in, in large numbers to actually get us better information about how people might use this. And so, you know, one strategy that we can employ is looking at, you know, there's this, been mo this model where we've been leveraging the mobile phone as kind of a ubiquitous platform, right? So the, so the mobile phone platform has actually kind of revolutionized the way we build applications at large scales. So this is an existing device that you already have with you. 
So how can we sneak in some applications on top of this already ubiquitous system that can give some uh, that, that can give you some hope of that technology being deployed. And so the mobile phone is interesting in that you know, lots of people have it, it's nearby, and it actually offers a wealth of computational capabilities. And so many researchers have seized the opportunity to build applications on this so they can start to get these deployed very quickly and in large scales. And so, um, and, and this has actually been a great platform for Ubicom. And so these are, uh, this is essentially now a wearable computer. But how do we apply that same metaphor, that analogy, to the home environment? What's ubiquitous about the home space that we can leverage so we can uh, enable the same kind of scale of deployment uh, for the applications? And so if you kind of, if you take a step back a couple years ago, so there's been this idea of using the living laboratories as, an, as a way of deploying technologies and evaluating it in situ. So the top is an example of the, the Aware Home Research Initiative at Georgia Tech. And on the bottom, this is an example of the House End project at MIT. And so, you know, 10 years ago, the idea was that we'll build a customized environment, deploy a bunch of sensors in that environment, and bring people in and see how we can evaluate these applications in situ. But the problem with that is that now we're moving to a point where we want to get these into real homes. There's no way we can replicate the aware home of the House End project in 250 million homes. I mean, these are $1 million endeavors each. So how do we move from that living laboratory model to individual homes? Um, uh, the other concern is that, well, if you bring people in to live in these facilities for a month uh, or a, cu a couple months, you still, don't give, you still don't have the natural experience that people have in their normal homes. So you really can't get at the right experiences with these uh, uh, living laboratory models. And so what we've been looking at is, well, how do we move away from the living laboratory? I think we've advanced technology to a point that we can start to move into real people's homes. But how do we really enable that? That's been the real challenge in ubiquitous computing recently. So looking at the mobile phone metaphor, so what, what else is available in a home that's common across all the homes? Well, it turns out there is a ubiquitous infrastructure. Uh, it's called the home utilities. So the home utilities like the electrical, plumbing, gas, telephony, all of those are, are fairly mundane infrastructures. I mean, you, people often take for granted how interesting of an infrastructure that is. They're fairly well maintained. You know, people want their electrical infrastructure working. Uh, they don't want leaks in their home. So it's fairly robust and fairly well maintained. We really never think of it as an electrical, the electrical infrastructure as a way to do electronics on top of it. You know, how do you build sensing on top of a, a fairly impoverished sense, uh, infrastructure? And so what we've been looking at as well, utilities are fairly common in a lot of homes. And how can we leverage the utilities to do in-home sensing in such a way that we can start to enable the scale that we've been uh, wanting to uh, 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 do for a while now? And so. Um, if you, if you look at sensing, there's essentially two approaches that you can consider uh, how you deploy a sensing uh, network or a sensing systems in the home. So the, the traditional approach, um, which we call dir uh, distributed direct sensing, is typically what you would find from the Mer Berkeley Motes model or distributed sensor model, which is, let's say you have a bunch of homes, a uh, bunch of rooms in your home that you want to deploy a sensing infrastructure for figuring out people's activities and location. And so what you typically would do is you install a bunch of sensors. It could be like a, a camera motion sensor. It could be a fairly general purpose one or a very targeted sensor. But you have to distribute a bunch of those in that space, typically at least one or two per room. And then somehow you have to connect them together, either wirelessly or through a wired link. And you run it through some kind of a pre-processing unit. So you take all that raw data, you pre-process it, and you extract relevant features that you can put it into a reasoning or machine learning system. And then you can come up with some high-level inferencing from it. And so this was the traditional model. So the model that we propose is, well, there's another idea called infrastructure-mediated sensing, which is, well, you still have those rooms there, but what's already there is that you have the utility infrastructure. Um, so you have electrical outlets, you have plumbing infrastructure, uh, you have you know, air ducts for heating, uh, ventilation, air conditioning system. But what's also really interesting about this is that they're already interconnected. So you don't actually have to worry about wiring up all these sensors. So so now the research question is, well, how do you actually interface with that utility infrastructure? And so now, instead of having a, a, a pre-processing unit for your sensor, you actually have a sensor interface with that infrastructure. So you can think of the utility infrastructure as a bus, very similar to like a network bus. And so one thing you could do on a 
on, on a network bus is you can monitor the packets going across that network bus to figure out what kind of activities people are engaging in. So you can reconstruct the packets. You can see where the destinations and sources are. Well, how can you do the same kind of analysis on the utility infrastructure to give you information about people's activity in the home? And the nice thing about this is that the infrastructure is already interconnected. You already have fixtures there. And now what we're looking at is, well, how can you modulate that signature on these fixtures in such a way that you can tap these points at one location? So now we're reducing the number of sensors that we need to deploy to increase the likelihood of being able to deploy these things in practical, in practical deployments. And then after you get that data, so there's a variety of ways you can get that, you can put it into the same kind of reasoning system and, uh, and come up with the same kind of inferencing that you would with a distributed sensing approach. All right? So, so if you compare the two approaches, you know, the challenge with the DDS, so the distributed direct sensing approach, is you typically need one or more sensors in the room. And, and there's been a lot of work that's shown that if you install, I mean, the number of uh, installation points in the home actually greatly affects the, uh, the, the eventual adoption of those technologies. In addition to that, often you know, th these things aren't very aesthetically pleasing. right? You have a bunch of these sensors deployed. You have to make sure that these things are going to be maintained. And so you have to reduce the number of failure points as well. And so IMS actually gives you the opportunity to actually retrofit things much more quickly. So you, with just a handful of sensors, just one sensor potentially, you can actually get the same kind of sensing you would with the DDS approach. So that's been the research agenda. So can we leverage this already ubiquitous infrastructure to give you the same kind of information that a distributed sensor network would give you? And so, uh, so we've built a bunch of these different IMS-based systems. And so I'll, go, I'll kind of enumerate through a, a variety of these and, and go into a little bit of detail uh, with a subset of those and talk about some of the applications we've built on top of them. So the first system is the, um, uh, the power line infrastructure. So one of the systems that we've been working on called power line event detection is literally a single plug-in module that you plug in any electrical outlet. So this is non-expert installable. You don't have to have an electrician coming in, cutting into wires. You, can, you literally just plug this device into an outlet. Well, what we can do is we can actually monitor the power line in such a way that we can identify exactly what electronic device is being activated. And so I'll talk about that in a second. But the idea here is that with a single plug-in module, we can monitor the events of each consumer electronic device that's plugged into the electrical grid inside the home. So now you can imagine the kind of applications you can build on this. We know when the toaster goes on. We know when you open the fridge door, when you close the fridge door. And you can tie those together to give you the similar kind of information that a distributed sensor network would have given you. And this is all done with a single plug-in module. Ishmael, yes. Can you run into the same problems that X10 does, where the sensing is less good if you're not on the same circuit, and some things like computer power supplies tend to condition the power for yeah. something that the removes. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So, so in typical, so in a standard home, you have two-phase wiring. So if you have something connected to one phase, it's hard for the signal to jump over. And so what we're looking at is the noise. So it turns out that they couple across the line. So even if you install it in one outlet and the signal source is on the other phase, you still see it. Um, the fact that the uh, power supplies and the computers are noisy is the fact that we actually leverage that fact. And so I'll talk about that in a second. Yeah? Is that you might power up like, overnight and then take and plot around your house with like, a laptop computer or a cell phone or something like that? Yeah, so, um, so, uh, so I'll get into a lot more detail about that in a second. So if that is, so that device that gets plugged into a different outlet, um, we still recognize the same PC or laptop. Uh, it doesn't matter what's plugged in. So uh, I'll talk about how, how that works. Yep. Um, and so that's electrical infrastructure. And so that was a way to passively snoop the power line infrastructure to figure out people's activities. So another strategy is, well, you already have this copper wiring in people's homes. What are the things that we can do on, on top of that infrastructure that can give you information about people's location? And so instead of just passively looking at that infrastructure, there's some things that you can use uh, actively on that system to try to figure out people's location. And so we built a device called Powerline Positioning, which is an active tag approach to localizing uh, devices in the environment. So think of an RFID system where you can localize the position of a tag based on a bunch of beacons installed in the environment. Well, it turns out you can actually use the physical copper in the walls in your home as the signaling antenna. So now the idea is you install two plug-in modules, and it actually turns your power line infrastructure into a signaling antenna. And so we built these little tags that can localize its position down to a meter. So this is something else I'll go into a little bit of detail as well. But now you're taking advantage of an existing infrastructure to do localization. So this one is if you want to figure out exactly where this particular laptop is or where a particular device is, you can just stick a tag on it. But now you no longer have to install 
a sophisticated infrastructure. Now it's just a two plug-in module system. We've done something very similar in the HVAC space. So this was something that uh, was kind of fascinating when we first got the results for this was it turns out if you have a, clo if you have a central air conditioning system in your home, um, uh, so an HVAC is heating, ven uh, ventilation, and cooling. So if you have a standard central air conditioning unit in your home, you can actually start to figure out people's motion in that space. So almost as if you were building a whole house motion detector uh, without having to distribute motion sensors throughout that space. And so I won't actually go into detail about this. I can talk to you about this a little bit later if you're interested. But the basic idea here is that the pressure dif differentials induced by people walking through the space manifest themselves in the air handler unit. So the air handler is the box where you actually have air coming in and you condition it, it goes out. Well, there's a nice place where an end user can install a sensor, which is at the air filter. So the air filter is inside of a sealed plenum box. That plenum actually has a pressure differential that's directly proportional to people's movement in that space. So it's not going to give us fine grain resolution down to a meter, but it'll tell you if they're on the west side of the house, the east side, or if there's movement in that space. And so the nice thing about that is you can instrument this air filter, let them install the sensor, and now you have a whole house motion detector that you don't have, that you don't have to distribute throughout the space. It turns out the most interesting application for this is by Carrier Incorporation. So Carrier is a very large manufacturer of HVAC units in the US. And what they're interested in doing with this technology is they want to do smart heating and cooling. And the reason why this is an important technology for them is because they can allow the, uh, the HVAC repairman to actually go in, modify their unit, and not touch anything else in the infrastructure, and still give them the same kind of sensing that they would have got with a motion detector system. And so they're looking at using this system as a way to do smart zoned heating and cooling without having to modify anything except their own unit in that space. Um, we've also moved to the, uh, the plumbing infrastructure. So looking at the same uh, uh, question there is, with a single sensor, can you figure out what fixture is being activated in the space and how much water is cons being consumed there? Same idea. We, don't want an, uh, we want a non-expert to be able to install this. So we don't want a plumber going out, cutting into pipes, nor do we want the homeowner cutting into pipes. So what we've looked at is, how can you build a single sensor that gives you similar information as if you had an inline sensor behind every one of your fixtures? And we'll go into a little bit of detail on that in a second as well. But the idea here is that each valve actually has a noise signature over the plumbing infrastructure that we're able to isolate and classify to figure out exactly which device it was and identify uniquely if it was the toilet in the bedroom or the bathroom. Oh, toilet in the master bath or the, uh, the guest bath. Yeah. Yep. Of, of insulation, there's some yeah. simplicity of characterization. Characterization, training, uh, so I'll talk about it in a second. Yeah. So what I'll talk about first is the power line positioning, infra uh, 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 power line positioning system. So power, remember, power line positioning is the idea of using the power line infrastructure as a signaling antenna. And so the idea behind this is for a standard home that's roughly about 5,000 square foot or smaller, you install two plug-in modules in the infrastructure. And um, the two, the, the two plug-in modules basically send a custom signal over the power line. And it treats the raw copper, the physical copper, as a signaling antenna. So the, the wiring in your, in your home actually acts as a, a very large antenna at roughly 27 megahertz. And so you can actually use that as the beacon. So you don't need to install a bunch of RFID sensors or transmitters throughout the space. You can actually just use the wiring in there. And then these tags, uh, which are roughly about an inch by inch, can be placed on a, an, uh, on a device that you're interested in tagging. And it can localize its position based on where it sat in the, uh, in the home. And so the way it works is these plug-in modules um, uh, emit a custom-tuned signal over the power line. So we actually worked out what those signals are because the, po the, pi the power line path is actually very inductive. And so we actually had to figure out the right signals to actually send over the power line. And we actually change between those over time uh, so that it's, it's constantly learning the power line characteristics. And these signals are actually picked up by our sensor. So these are literally radiated off the power line. So in the, in the 70s, a lot of universities, what they did was, because they couldn't afford AM towers, they actually sent it over the power line. You can actually get AM broadcast being propagated off the electrical wiring in, at, at your dorm, for example. So a similar principle applies here. But we're actually doing, instead of doing amplitude modulation, we're actually using different modulation schemes here. But we're actually using the copper as a way to radiate that signal off of it. And these tags are picking them up at different locations. And so we, what we can extract are a bunch of features there. You know, the signal strength, the, uh, the relative phase difference. Yeah? yeah the model, the layout of, of the wiring in your home at all? Uh, you could, but you don't have to. So the way we do the training is uh, 
is, uh, which I'll get into in a second, is that you basically do a couple sample points. So you can do a fingerprinting-based approach for a, a set of areas and then extrapolate what the model is of the, of the electrical infrastructure. So let's say if we just want to look at the signals at two different locations. Let's say you have a three-story house and you want to look at the kitchen and the bedroom. And so if you zoom into here, if you just look at the raw signal, just this amplitude, the SNR, um, and the red one is, let's say, signal A and uh, the green one is signal B. And these are just the two modules. If you just look at the sheer amplitude, a couple of things you would notice. The first is the signal strengths actually flip. The reason for that is the chaotic nature of the electrical infrastructure actually is enough to give you the spatial discriminability to be able to figure out what that tag is. So if you just looked at amplitude, it gives you a lot of information at a room level where you are. And if you zoom into one of these little quadrants, these are roughly one meter quadrants or one, one meter squares. Um, the amplitudes also change as you move to the perimeter of the, of the room because you're getting closer to the electrical infrastructure. And as you move away, it actually diminishes. And so just looking at the amplitude, you can actually get a lot of information about where this tag might be located. And if you feed that back in with you know, the phase difference of arrival and some other features, you can actually get a, a, a very solid fingerprint about where this uh, tag might be residing in that space. And so, uh, and so the lo one localization algorithm is using a fingerprinting approach where we take the tag, which is the calibration sequence, which is what Bjorn's question is about, is how do you model this? You know, how do you know where the tag is? Well, what we've been doing is we have a site survey that you do. So on the interface, you sketch out your floor plan. And you go to certain locations in that floor plan, and you tag those locations. So I'm in the, the west part of this bedroom, on the east part. And you just sample those locations and then create a fingerprint of it. And then it turns out if you have enough fingerprints, let's say in a roughly a 10 by 10 foot home or a 10 by 10 uh, room, 10 foot by 10 foot, if you do three or four uh, samples, we can actually interpolate what the values are going to be based on those, uh, the distribution of the signal there. And so we can use that as a fingerprint of each location in the space. And, and there's a variety of different techniques we've used, but KNN actually ends up being the best. So when we back propagate the actual signal map, we can actually take the current location, what the signal is, and try to figure out in our map where we are. And so the, 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 the caveat is that you need to have at least a fairly um, uh, you, you need a good mapping between the signal, the signal map and the actual space that you're looking at. So you can give it a high level label like bedroom or kitchen if you just want to know room level location. If you need to know down to a meter, you still have to at least get a few samples in that space. So, um, so this, this is right now, it's actually, so this, this slide is a little old. So we've deployed in more than 24 homes at the moment. But what we had was most of these were installed by the, in, uh, the, the homeowner or the consumer that wanted to use the technology. And so it roughly takes about 15 to 30 minutes to install. And so this includes creating a little site survey map and actually going out and strategically um, um, calibrating the different locations. And so they go back and recalibrate certain locations if they don't think the accuracy is um, um, to, to whatever level that, they're, that they uh, predicted it would be at. So typically, the room level accuracy is about 92%. So down to a room in a standard home, you can actually uh, figure out what room they're in with up to 90% accuracy. Um, well, one of the things that's even more interesting is the subroom level precision. So how, what's, the, what's the granularity of this location tracking system? So if you look at the cumulative distribution function, so this basically is error in meters. So at one, at one meter, the error is about, uh, the, the accuracy at one meter is about 80%, a little over 80%, 85%. So you can actually get down to about a meter with just two plug-in modules which actually is much more accurate than using an RFID system, which typically takes two or three uh, beacons to be deployed per room. And so now we can start to get to the point where we can start to identify where devices might be on a table or in a quadrant of the room. And so not just room level localization. And the nice thing about this is that the installation process is mainly just the calibration sequence. The, you no longer have to worry about the hardware installation for this kind of technology. Yeah. Family dwellings, crosstalk on transmitter or receiver. Yeah, so so that that exactly. So um, so if it's a single family home, the um, uh, your home ac actually is pretty much isolated. So from the meter to the can, so basically the transformer can that's on the pole, the ductus there is actually enough that that the signal is blocked. The other reason it, the other reason why it's isolated is the utility doesn't want your electrical noise propagating back to the grid, and so the can actually acts as the isolator. So the, the, only look, the time when this would be a concern is if you have this installed in a condo, and if you have a shared wall, and if they both have the same system installed, then they could be picking up, you could be picking up their signature. Right? So if you have a shared wall, that could be a concern. 
So, uh, so here's an example of the tracking, just to give you an idea of, of what it looks like. So what we did was we put our tag on a Roomba and just had the Roomba just move around, right? So it's fairly random, random uh, pattern. And the bottom is actually the tracker. So that top window is the window up there. And so you can see how, how it tracks. And notice how it's very jumpy in the middle of the room because it's pretty far away from the power line. But when, it, when it's near the wall, it's actually, it actually tracks much better, than a, uh, much better than one meter. It's usually down to about 30 centimeters is how well it tracks. Um, and also notice that this is on a Roomba. It has a motor in it, so it actually has its own load, inductive load. So it's actually noisy at its own uh, frequency. So it's actually so. So we were careful in figuring out how to do this in such a way that we're beyond some of the noise signatures that might already be occurring in the home. And so, so we can do room level and subroom level localization with just a handful of modules. So I'll let that play for a second, then I'll move on. <coughs> So another thing to note is we're actually applying a Kalman filter to this, so that's why it looks so straight. So every now and then it jumps, uh, and when it jumps, it's basically when it just lost the signal for a second. But, but that's why you can see, that's, that's why it's so straight, is because of the Kalman filter. Does the transmitted signal have more than more information on it digitally? Uh, it's an analog signal. It's an analog signal. There's no modulation on it. So, so we, we, there's another effort that it is modulated for the shared, um, so for the shared wall example. But this one is not. This one's not. So, um, so there's been a couple, couple of interesting applications we've been using power line positioning for. Uh, one of the latest things we've been working on is we're look, working at, with researchers in the rehabilitation community to look at, well, how can we use the power line positioning system to allow them to uh, monitor and, and, and give, give them better information about people's mobility patterns in the home, in particular wheelchair users in the home. One of the challenges that the rehab community has seen is that they want to get mobility patterns in the home, but they really don't have a technology that they can easily deploy. Because typically in their community, they want to do thousands of homes simultaneously. And usually they have a medical practitioner, a loved one, or maybe a nurse that might go in and install these technologies. And so they can't really afford the capital to have a truck roll go out and install it. And so the idea is, can we package this up into a little kit that we send to the nurse or the practitioners, and they install the device and get this data coming back up. And th so that's what we've been working on. We've actually been working with the rehab community both in Atlanta in, in, and in Seattle to look at, well, how can we use the power line positioning technology to give them mobility data about wheelchair users in the space? So what they're interested in knowing is not only where they are in the space, but they also want to know where transitions happen. So when they move from a wheelchair to the cane or from the cane to a walker, and where those trans, uh, transitions occur and also to augment the interviews that they have. So instead of just relying on self-report, you know, they're, they're using this empirical data to ask better questions about uh, specific incidences that might arise. So if they were particularly tired one day and, and if, if they find that it was the wheelchair or the walker was the issue, they actually have actual empirical evidence to go back and look at, well, this was probably the case, and then you can actually um, use that as a way to uh, 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 bolster the, uh, the interview process itself. And the other critical thing is, like I said, is the non-expert installation of these technologies. And so we're looking at how other communities can also take advantage of the tracking solution um, um, to, uh, uh, to, to, implement, to improve the interview process as well. And so, so this is something that we're very familiar with in the ACI community where self-report is very limited. But if you can augment it with some empirical data, you can actually start to improve that process. And this is one way of doing it that has low overhead in terms of the installation procedure. And so this is an example of the tracking uh, data. Um, so, I mean, uh, so, so this is basically what we did was we gave them the technology and we had their programmers actually just build a simple interface. And this is what they came up with, which was they just wanted to, in this example, they wanted to know where the transition points were. And so wherever you have a, uh, where the lines meet up, this is where they change to a different, uh, different mobility aid. And so one of the things that came out of this one, which was fascinating, was the, uh, the area near the dining room at the top. So this area right here. This turned out to be uh, an important place for this particular uh, user to actually turn around in her wheelchair. Because it turned out that that was the only place that she had enough of a radius to actually turn around. So it actually ended up being kind of the meeting point for this. Um, and so this was the kind of data that they were able to extract from the uh, location tracking the, uh, information that they were using for this, uh, for this application. So the other technology uh, that I talked about, which is the power line vent system. The power line vent detection is basically a passive system. We're not sending any signals over the power line, just passively listening to the power line infrastructure to see if we can identify what appliances are being activated in the home. 
And so the idea behind this is, can we use that as a proxy for human activity? And so the basic idea is to just get the events, the electrical events in the home using a single device. So we don't want to install a current sensor. We don't want to install a distributed sensor network in there. We just want a single device that detects electrical activity in that home. And so uh, and what we have is a, signal, uh, um, uh, a single plug-in module that has an embedded, uh, um, an embedded uh, Linux system built into it that does all the signal processing locally, and it sends it back to a PC. So the way that this approach works is that um, typically in electrical engineering, a lot of people consider noise, uh, people's signals their noise, right? So the idea here is that the noise is actually our signal. Um, so instead of using current, which is typically what people have used in the community, which is you look at how much current is being consumed in the home, and that is usually indicative of what kind of load might be occurring. So if you see a 1,000 watt load, it's probably your hair dryer. If you see 10,000 watts, it might be an oven. The problem with that is it doesn't really quite give you the right uh, level of granularity. What about 200 watt light bulbs, right? They're going to look similar. Um, and so what we've been looking at is instead of looking at the current, you can look at something else, which is the voltage. So it turns out consumer electronic devices are actually pretty noisy over the power line. Um, there's two different kinds of noisy loads. One is traditional electronic devices, which are things like resistive loads, so incandescent light bulb, your stove, your oven. These are loads that are purely resistive. There's no noise signature that propagates over the power line. Um, typically, they manifest themselves as thermal noise or Johnson noise. But what you do see is the switch that it's connected to. So this light switch that connects to your incandescent light bulb actually has a noise signature that propagates over the power line called a transient electrical noise signature. The transient electrical pulse actually ends up being unique to the location where it is in the home because the power line infrastructure acts as a transfer function. So if you have two light switches that are connected to similar loads, they actually look different when it gets to the sensor because the path it has to take. And so for simple light switches, we can actually detect when a light switch gets flipped. And it turns out that that's unique to that particular light switch. More modern electronic devices like the power supply to my laptop or uh, a CFL, a compact fluorescent light bulb, or a television actually has a different noise source. It still has that transient uh, uh, phenomenon that occurs when you first turn it on. But what else? It, the other thing it has is continuous noise patterns that propagate over the power line. These things are switching power supplies. So they have an internal oscillator that are resonant to its uh, internal capabilities. So an LCD has an internal power supply that was resonant about 150 kilohertz. And it turns out you can actually see that over the power line, no matter where it's plugged in. These things are actually fairly noisy that you can pick it up pretty much anywhere in the home, as long as you're plugged into the wall. And you can actually characterize those signatures to figure out what kind of load it is. For example, a TV will look different from a CFL because the load that it's running has a different power supply characteristic. So you can look at uh, those signatures to actually figure out what kind of load's happening in that space. So an example might be a light switch. So this is a light switch, that, uh, a snapshot in the spectrogram space. So on the y-axis is just the, uh, the frequency, and the color is the intensity at that frequency bin. So this is the same light switch uh, over a, a seven-day period. So one of the things that's interesting is that the on and off events look different. Um, so when you turn the switch on, turn it off, they actually have a unique transient ca uh, characteristic that's actually different, even though it's the same switch. And temporally, over time, those switches still look, that switch still looks the same. If I superimpose a different switch on there, you'd actually have a different characteristic. So what this allows us to do is by monitoring the power line, we can uniquely figure out which switches are being activated and how often they've been activated. And the other thing that we can do is now, by looking at the continuous noise source, we can automatically classify what kind of device it is. So we've built a model for what a television looks like, what a CFL looks like, and use those characteristics as a way to identify what kind of class it is. So we don't know exactly which one it is, right? We don't know it's the one in the bedroom or the bathroom. Uh, we know, but we do know that we can get somebody to label that. So if somebody labels that data, then we know what the high level mapping is. But, but by looking at the signal characteristics, we can always give you uh, the category of device that that is. And by using this transient pulse, we can tell you how many of those you have. So not only do we know that a CFL went off, but we know this is the unique CFL because it has a different switch associated with it. So by monitoring that line, now we know you have 10 CFLs. Here are the different usage patterns of that CFL. And so uh, here's, here's a, uh, just a, an example of the different kinds of devices that we've, uh, 
we've kind of encountered in our deployments. Um, so some of the basic things are you know, uh, things that you might find in a kitchen. Right? So these are the kinds of things that we can detect with that single device. Um, so microwave, ovens, you know, those are typical things. Now you can start to imagine, well, if you start to um, aggregate this data, now you know what kind of activities people might be engaging in. Now you can start to get into the cooking activities um, by looking at a series of these events occurring. Well, something that's kind of interesting is the, uh, the microwave door and fridge door. So you might wonder why we can actually pick that up. Well, it turns out that there's a light in there. The light is connected to a switch. It's not a standard toggle switch. It's actually a little, little uh, lever switch. But that switch still has the same kind of noise characteristics that a toggle switch has. So even subtle things like a fridge door light, we can see being propagated over the electrical infrastructure. Um, uh, the other things are incandescent and fluorescent lights. So lighting in your home and which lights are you activating. So if you, use the, if you activated the one in the kitchen and the one in the living room, we can get a sense of the pattern that people are um, engaged in, in in the home as well. <clears throat> so, yeah? So have you combined uh, power line localization and detection to, yeah. to simplify, simplify the labeling? Uh, yeah, so, so, that, so basically giving somebody a tag and that they wear for maybe a day or, or carry it around for a day. And whenever they activate a device, we know where the event happens and we know their location. So we've used that as a strategy to label it. But what we've been doing now is a lot of uh, unsupervised learning on top of that. Because it turns out these signals um, are already available out there. It turns out the FCC database already gives you the noise characteristics. So we've been mining the data from FCC and ETL to actually give us the database for free. Right? Uh, and those are all publicly available. So we've already created a database that we look up to figure out if it's the television, if it's a C in fact, if it's a plasma or LCD television. So now we're using that, so we don't actually require human labeling anymore. Uh, so that's a great question. I was going to ask that at the end. So it turns out the, best, the, the worst thing for the uh, power line positioning technology is Christmas. So when we, did the <laughs> when, we did the when, we when we deployed the technology in October, uh, we had about five homes we were doing in October, and it ran through February. Christmas was when the accuracy went down. And it was because when people install a Christmas tree, there's about 30 feet of wiring that they put around it. right? And so, um, so that's a localized effect. What happens there is you essentially modify the electrical infrastructure. So the bedroom doesn't get impacted that much, but it was near that living room where the, the wiring actually uh, changed the electrical infrastructure there. So it was localized. So we knew that this thing was causing a problem here. So the way we knew it was an anomaly was we were using the hysteretic data to say that, OK, we know we're, we're tracking well, but now the data just looks really, it looks like you're in the living room. Away from the living room, it looks like you're in the second floor bedroom. So we had a, little, we had a piece of code in there that did the anomaly detection. But, but that's a great example of how you can temporarily change the electrical infrastructure. Yeah. Oh, sorry. It's really bright. So you have two different kinds of noise signatures, right? One is momentary yeah. for, for switches, and the other one is continuous for right. the keep running. How well are you divide out different continuous sources operating simultaneously? Yes, so that's a great question. So for, for the momentary transient ac activities, they're so short-lived, 5, 10 milliseconds, that the likelihood that they overlap, it's, it's, it's very rare. For the continuous noise sources, um, these are usually resonant at a certain frequency. So if you look at spectrogram, if you look at an FFT this way, so this is the noise signature this way. So a CFL would be a line here. And so if there's something else that's simultaneously on, it'll be somewhere else. But let's say you had three CFLs on. Well, what you do is you zoom into that spectrogram there. And so they're, they'll be superimposed on top of each other. But it turns out that even if you have the same manufacturer for that CFL, same device, um, they're still off by a few FFT bins. The reason for that is the electronic components in here have tolerances. They're about 10% different, right? And so they're actually shifted a little bit. So it's a Gaussian, but they're overlapped. And so we look at the sitter frequencies and pull it out that way. So what we've been doing recently is looking at, the, looking at how we can leverage the same kind of capabilities over the plumbing infrastructure or the water infrastructure, which is detecting water events down to each fixture and how much flow is going to that fixture. And so the idea here is, again, single point sensor, um, no plumber required for the installation, so no cutting the pipes. We're not, we're not leveraging a smart meter. We're installing something that's very simple that a homeowner can install. And so the idea behind this work is a single screw-on module, which is installed at a water spigot. And so it's the, the top left is an example of one of our prototypes. So you can imagine this being installed on a water spigot. You turn it on, and then you have a pass-through, so you can continue to use it as normal. But the idea behind this is very similar to the electrical domain. 
is that instead of having an electromagnetic impulse over the power line, you actually have a pressure impulse. So uh, every now and then, when you use your water in your home, you might actually hear the, the uh, pipes bang behind the walls, or you might hear a, a thumping noise. Well, that's actually called water hammer. And so often people think a water hammer is this nebulous thing that you know, they don't know where it comes from. But it actually turns out that water hammer is the modulation of a pressure impulse from the valve itself. So when you change the, from kinetic to potential energy and back uh, in reverse, the impulse that's created actually causes the pipes to reverberate. And this is actually going back and forth in the entire in, in, in the plumbing infrastructure. So if you look at it, how uh, the pipe paths are laid out, they're all interconnected. Hot is even con connected to the cold water system through the water heater. So you can think of this as a big capacitor, but an electrical impulse still propagate, or the, uh, the pressure impulse still propagates throughout the entire system. Um, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, does that mean would you even have to sense the water pressure directly? Or couldn't you just stick a piezo on a pipe? You could. You could. The problem with that is that um, um, let's say let's say you uh, you flush a toilet here and it goes all the way to the the, the spigot out there. Uh, it's actually pretty attenuated, so you have to have a pressure transducer to pick up the small fluctuations. At this location, it, it might be a 10 psi differential. It might be a huge pressure differential. But when you get to that location, it's going to be pretty much attenuated. So you actually have to have a transducer there. Uh, the other problem with having a piezo there is that depending on the kind of plumbing, um, the, the, the material for the plumbing system, it's not going to be the same in terms of the, uh, the way that the, uh, the signal propagates throughout the, the pipe paths. So a PVC might work better than copper or vice versa. Um, so you could put a microphone there, but the microphone don't give, doesn't give you the same kind of data. And so, yeah? So those are, those are um, uh, effects on the overall pressure differential. So if you just monitor how much pressure you have, so typically your pressure is about 60 PSI. So it might go down to 55 PSI. But the signature, the impulse that's resulting from that, is what we're looking at, not the actual absolute pressure. Um, and so, so let's say you turn on a, co a hot water uh, faucet. We actually see that on the cold water line because it's going through the water heater. And so what does that look like? So this is an example uh, signal trace of a faucet, a toilet, and a tub. And so the shape of the waveform is actually indicative of the kind of fixture you have. So a manually operated valve looks different from a toilet, fla toilet flapper, which also looks different from an um, electromechanic valve, which you might find in a laundry machine or a dishwasher. And so the valving actually modulates the way that the signal lo signature looks like. So what we're doing is we're extracting the impulse and we're actually modeling what kind of valve it is. So is it, a, is it a toilet or is it actually a faucet? And so that tells us what kind of faucet it is. Well, tells us what kind of fixture it is. Is it a faucet or a toilet? But what's also interesting is that just like in the electrical space, the pipe paths act as a transfer function. So if you have, even if you have two toilets that are the same brand, they look different because the characteristics of the impulse are different. So what we do is we extract those features, which is the decay rate, the relative amplitude, and the frequency at which the modulation occurs. And those are actually, that, that information tells you which one it is. So not only do we know it's the toilet, but we know which one it is based on that unique characteristic. And so um, in the home environment, there, there are about, on average, about 10 fixtures. And, and if you double that, there's about 20. So if you have each faucet has a hot and a cold. So there's about 20 events that you can probably find in a home. Um, and, and each one of those are actually unique based on that characteristic. Um, yeah? Affected by, say, like the speed with, at which you open or close a valve? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so let's say we call those partial turn events. So let's say you turn the valve on a little bit, then you kind of correct for it. So you know it's not cold enough or it's too warm, you might correct for it. So what will happen is you'll get the in initial impulse, and that correction will be uh, superimposed on top of that waveform. So what will happen is when you first turn it on, the waveform is going back and forth in, this, in the entire system. Right? That one is still going, and then when you correct for it, it's modulated on top of it. So we actually extract out the base waveform and ignore the top one. Um, so this, in signal processing, this is called homomorphic processes, where you can actually ins uh, um, extract the superposition problem out of that. So the other thing that we've been looking at is, well, the, this signature actually gives us pressure drops, right? So if you look at the derivative, just the drop in pressure, we can start to infer how much water is flowing there. So we know which device got activated or which fixture got activated, but how do we know how much water flows there? So you can actually use the, the drop in pressure as a way to infer how much water is being consumed. But the caveat there is, well, uh, you need to know the pipe path or the resistance factor. right? You can't just use the pressure drop to tell you how much flow in GPM. 
So what we do here is what we did was we extracted the relevant features that we would need to actually come up with a model for that. And it turns out there's only three things you need to know. The rough size of the home, so in square footage, how many fixtures you have in the home, and the kind of plumbing system you have. Is it copper, galvanized, or PVC? And that's actually enough to give us a model for the actual home so that we can apply that a correction factor to the pressure differential. And it turns out that that approach is actually more accurate than the average water meter out there. So when we were doing these experiments with a real inline flow meter, we were actually more accurate than a 10-year, or sorry, a 50-year-old water meter. Water meters are typically about 10% off. Um, usually it's in your favor. You actually pay less for water than, than, than it's supposed to. But every now and then you might find a water meter where you pay more for water than what it's consuming. Um, but, uh, but that approach turns out to be more accurate because typically a regular water meter is a mechanically driven valve um, that over time wears down. So it's actually magnetically driven. Right. So and, and the, the exactly. So a leak is basically water being consumed without an associated valve event, right? Or you have a, a toilet event, and it, the water keeps running, but you never have the closed toilet event. So, so toilet leaks are an example of that. Uh, irrigation leaks are another example of that. Yes, low flow rates. So. What we've been doing with this technology is we've kind of moved beyond the activity recognition applications and looking into uh, resource monitoring and feedback. With this technology, now you can imagine uh, looking at feedback applications for consumers about consumption in their home. And so this is stuff that we've been working on recently with and also working with Kerry here at the pre -court, looking at ways that we can use this sensor data to actually feed it back to homeowners and consumers in a variety of different ways. So we've been looking at how can we use this data, working with the utilities, to give people itemized feedback about their consumption. Uh, and so the idea behind this is looking at how can we reduce that, that disconnect between the electric and water bill that you get at the end of the month to your actual consumption. So, so, that, so you know, typically you get something like this, right? You get a water bill that's an aggregate number. You know? So you owe $3,000 this month. This is literally a $3,000 water bill that's from a colleague of mine. And I think Scott knows him very well. Um, uh, um, so he got a $3,000 water bill uh, two months ago. Ironically, this was the same uh, house that we installed HydroSense in, but we had already removed it by the time he got the water bill. Um, but when he, got, when he got the water bill, he actually had no idea where the consumption was happening. At first, he assumed it was incorrect reading, but when he read his meter, it's actually correct. He had a leak, and the leak was actually the irrigation system outside, so he couldn't see what happened there. So the HydroSense approach would have actually identified a leak and an unassociated valve event, and we would have been able to see that at the time it occurred, rather than two months later. So two months later, they saw it on the bill. The utilities didn't see it until they read the meter. So you can see how, how much value you can have with not, not only just feedback for consumption, but also anomaly detection for these as well. This was actually an interesting story because the water bill was only $2,000. I say only $2,000 because they didn't charge him for sewage. In most municipalities, for every gallon of water you consume, you've got to pay for sewage, which is 10 times more expensive. This would have been a $10,000 water bill, right? But they only charge them for the water that leaked out. Um, so, um, but that's an example of when, if you had itemized feedback, you'd actually know when it would have happened and what, it, what was causing the problem. And so that's what we're working on, is looking at itemized billing and disaggregated feedback. Um, a lot of work in environmental psychology has showed up to 15 to 20% a sustained reduction in consumption if you can reduce that disconnect and giving people idea, a better idea about what devices that they're using and how much power that it's consuming. And the technology that we've built, although it was originally motivated for activity recognition, gives you that information. It tells you which fixtures and appliances are operating and how much resources are they consuming. And so that's what we've been moving uh, 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 forward with in the space recently. One of the things that we're lacking uh, at this point right now uh, until one of the things that the power line vent detection lacked is the fact that we don't know how much power it consumed, right? We know that a light bulb went off, we know that a TV went off, but how, much, how do we know how much power it consumed? The only way you can get that information is if you get it from the meter, um, because the current information has to be at the ingress, where the, where the power is coming in, and you have to be in line with the device. And so, you know, there, there's been some existing technologies out there that gives you whole house consumption that allows you to correlate when that event happens to the power consumption. But they're fairly tip fairly hard to install. This is an example of one. You rip off the p electrical panel, you put these two current transformers inside of it, and then you jam a wire into the socket. Right? And, and, and typically, this is obviously going to require an electrician. Uh, uh, the average homeowner or end user can install this. And so what we've been looking at is, can we build a way to get us current consumption, power consumption, at a whole house level that we can roll out at large scales? 
So it's something that the end user or the non-expert can deploy these technologies without the need for an electrician. And so we built um, the latest uh, contactless current consumption sensor. This sensor is actually literally plug plugged in on the outside of the breaker panel. So it's a little square sensor that expands in and out. And so it expands in and out because there's three manufacturers of electrical panels out there, Siemens, GE, and Cutler Hammer. And so what this allows you to do is it allows you to expand the sensor in and out to roughly get it aligned with your breakers. And there's two LEDs on there for feedback, which basically act like a stud finder. So when you bring it up to the breaker panel, when it detects the 60 hertz cycle, it knows that you're in the right location. You peel the tape off behind it, and you stick it on there. And that gives you the same information that this uh, sensor would give you. But now this could be installed by an end user. And so we wrapped up a, a deployment where we had eight users uh, at averages of 62 years old who actually installed this themselves, where we actually shadowed them and just observed the installation process. We were interested in the mental model that they had of installing this device. And so eventually, when we iterated on the design, it turned out we just needed two LEDs. The reason why we need two is because there's two bars back there. And that's all they needed was to know that, is this the right spot? If it is, that's where I'm going to put it. And so we iterated on a few designs to figure out that it was just the LED that they needed. And they were able to install this uh, themselves uh, fairly quickly. And whereas the TED device or the other device that we showed with the current consumption sensor um, would have required an electrician. Uh, and, and so uh, w right now what we've been doing is not only just a deployment, but we're just doing a comparison to see how accurate it is to a, to a power meter. And we're within 4% of the true power, which is actually pretty good considering that most meters are around that, that accuracy as well. Um, and so, so I've shared with you, you know, some technologies for the water and the electricity space for disaggregation. Um, I don't have time to go into it today, but we've also been working in the gas space. Gas is actually even more of a fascinating space because there's no analog to a plug-in module, right? There's no electrical outlet in the analog, or there's no screw-in module. Uh, gas is a fairly, fairly constrained environment for a variety of reasons, mainly for safety. And so how do you, how do you build a low-cost sensor that could interface with the gas infrastructure to give you that data? Um, and so what we did was we've actually built a sensor that clips onto your regulator outside. So if you look at your gas meter, you have a nationally mandated regulator that you will see. It's a big disk. And we built a sensor, which is literally a disk clip-on. You clip it on. It automatically calibrates itself and gives you information about gas consumption. And it's inferred through the regulator diaphragm that's uh, already available in your home. And so this is idea, the idea, again, is leveraging that signal, that noise pattern, as our signal. Um, so before I close, I want to talk about a couple other research areas that we're pursuing. Um, so one of the things that we've been looking at in the ubiquitous computing space is eventually we're going to go with a distributed sensor model. Uh, but the problem, is that's gonna, the problem with that is the battery consumption, right? power consumption. There's no way you're going to be replacing 1,000 you know, batteries in your home. And you know, how do we actually solve that issue, that overhead? So the lab's been looking at a variety of different power harvesting techniques. You know, wireless power transfer is one thing uh, that we've been looking at in collaboration with uh, Intel Labs in Seattle. Uh, we've also been looking at uh, thermoelectric harvesting, so differentials, thermoelectrical differentials to see if we can power sensors. One of the things that we've been doing recently is we can actually harvest enough power off the skin and the uh, ambient temperature to power really low, low cost sensors and low power sensors for medical monitoring. Um, some other things we've been looking at is, you know, the sensors that we talked about here, like the water sensor is battery powered, but how can we take advantage of the water impulse, that impulse that's generated as a way to self power it? So self-sustaining sensors is another area that we're moving into to so completely reduce the requirement for the battery. Um, and so that's, that's something that the lab is focusing on. Um, another area that we're really interested in, in pursuing, where we're doing a lot of the formative work right now, is home safety and maintenance. You know, often we neglect our homes because it's just, there's, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things to be able to take care of there, and it's really hard to know what to prioritize over what. So how can we build technology to help us uh, in just maintaining our physical plant, which is our home? Uh, we spend a lot of time there. We also invest a lot of money into our home. So how do we uh, allow a consumer to actually do a better job of maintaining their home? And so we're looking at not only just the formative work right now, but looking at existing technologies and how that actually uh, is playing a role right now and if there is, uh, or, or, or what the concerns are. Uh, finally, we've uh, been you know, kind of going back to the mobile phone. You know, the mobile phone's a nice platform. What else can we do with it uh, that, that, that we can leverage using the commodity sensors that you already find on a phone? Uh, one of the things that we're working on with, uh, in, this is in collaboration with Children's Hospital in Seattle and Microsoft Research, which is how can we use the mobile phone, the sensor on the mobile phone, which is which, uh, the microphone in particular, um, for childhood asthma monitoring. 
So one of the concerns with a chronic childhood asthma is spirometry, which is the idea of doing lung, uh, lung uh, volume measurements and peak flow measurements throughout the day. So typically, they need to actually do this daily. The problem is that they often forget the spirometers, or it's, really, uh, it's actually a fairly difficult device to use, or they might not have one available as, during certain situations. So how can we embed a little bit of firmware into a microphone-based device? It could be a mobile phone or even a Leapster Leapfrog. A lot of toys out there actually have microphones built into it. These are just pressure transducers. So how can we le leverage those signals to do spirometry? And so what we've been doing is we've actually built a system that does um, spirometry on a mobile phone, so like on an iPhone, using the mi actual microphone as a way to infer lung capacity. And the way we're doing that is modeling the lip radiation patterns. And so using that as a way to infer what lung capacity uh, they're at. And so what we need here is a calibration sequence. So it's calibrated once at the doctor's office with a real spirometer. And we, re we need the rough age and weight to get the lung, uh, the trachea model. And so we're using that as a way to estimate what their peak flow values are. And so we can feed this data back to the medical practitioners to see what the trending data is like. For one example of when this is critical is when they change their, me uh, their regimen for, for, the, for the medication that they're uh, administering, they want to see how the uh, lung uh, volume is changing, the capacity is changing. So they might want to reduce or increase that. And they want to be able to monitor that, monitor that in real time uh, over uh, periods of a few days, rather than having them come in every week or every month. And so we're looking at how we can leverage these commodity devices to do mobile health monitoring is another space that we've moved into. So finally, I'd like to conclude with uh, um, you know, this notion of uh, moving towards practical ubiquity, where instead of solving the problem where we're building new devices that are going to be installed you know, at large scales, what we're trying to do is, well, let's start to solve the retrofit problem first. There's more homes that we need to retrofit than are, than are being built in the next 10, 20, even 30 years. There's 250 million homes that we need to take care of now. And if we start to look at the retrofit problem, I think we have a better hope of getting some of these UVCOM technologies deployed at large scales and focusing on the end user deployability of them. There's no, the, 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 the burden uh, quite often is on the installation. So if we can get the end users or the non-experts to install these technologies, I think we have a better hope of getting these things deployed. And infrastructure mediated sensing is one way to kind of enable that. Leveraging existing infrastructures and signals that are already out there, be it accidental signals, there's still signals that we can leverage to do sensing that wasn't uh, possible in the past. And a lot of this work has some really interesting implications for energy monitoring, which is what the lab is moving forward with, is looking at how can we take the sensor data and build effective feedback applications uh, that can actually drive behavior change. And that's some of the focus of the, uh, for, the, for the next year or so for us. All right? Thank you. Sensors. Um, so, so a lot of so a lot of the work is actually being commercialized, and so it's uh, so, this, so I would say a little bit less than a year. Yeah. Hey, down, down there, the same line of questioning. You're really going for wide deployment. Mm -hmm. um, can you speculate about regulatory hurdles that you have? Is there, you know, yeah, the underwriters lab? Okay, yeah, I, I, I know the regulator, the regulatory agencies very well now. Um, so UL is one. So things you got to plug into the wall, which is actually not too difficult. Well, the more, uh, for the power line positioning technology, FCC is more of a concern because we're actually injecting a signal over the power line. All of our signals are actually well below FCC. Um, so we had to do this for a variety of reasons. One is for uh, the IRB at our university required us to comply with FCC, which is actually interesting in itself, right? Um, and also, that technology also is being licensed, and so they had to be <coughs> below FCC as well. So it's, it's an interesting challenge, right? Um, but we're also taking that to our advantage, right? You know, I talked about how we're getting the database for all the signatures. Well, FCC is on our side in that case, because all the devices are noisy, but they have to be below some noise level. Um, and they have to publish it, right? They have to show that, OK, we're actually below this level, but it turns out we have the spectrogram. And then we're mining that data to correlate it to which devices are being used. Yeah? Uh, I was wondering how the characterization of like, when you're detecting different events, you have to, at the beginning, you have to calibrate. Uh, a lot of the, how does that change over time? Like how often would you need to? Yeah, calibrate? so it depends on what you mean by calibration. So let's say in, we're in the electrical space, right? So, there, so without calibration, we can get pretty far. Um, so the noise characteristic is often indicative of the kind of load it is. So, so CFLs are unique in the way they look as opposed to a, a plasma CRT or an LED television or, or LCD television. All of those look different. So automatically, we can actually figure out what kind of device it is. 
Um, so, but, but there are some situations where you have to label, uh, let's say there's a device that doesn't have a unique signature, it's just the switch, which is just some random signature. Um, so those you would have to label. And so uh, the, some of the deployments that we've done, there was the longest deployment right now has been about over a year. When we went back at one month, at the six month mark, and the one year mark, and the calibration is actually still there. Uh, what we're doing is, although some of the, so if you look at the entire feature set, a lot of those actually change because you might install new devices, you might have a new appliance, but, but, but because we're looking at the entire band, uh, most of those are actually still pretty resilient to change over time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, two parts. So, so have you looked at the mechanical infrastructure at all? Uh, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. So, you know, strain gauges are another way to kind of infer motion or movement. Vibration. Vibration. Um, um, so th that, that's one thing we've looked at. The uh, other thing that's been kind of fascinating is the um, the drywall. The drywall actually is a pretty cool infrastructure because it's a hydrophobic surface, and you can start to uh, infer people. So you can start to do large scale interaction on a, on the um, uh, on the drywall itself by at, in, installing a, a handful of trans pressure transducers on it. Um, so you can start to use that as an interactive surface, which we're starting to move into also. So you can imagine two things that you clip onto the drywall, and then you have an input surface that's roughly, you know, uh, five foot by five foot. Um, so the building codes are, so we actually take that, that's actually an advantage for us. So the fact that NEC or National Electric Code regulates how the electrical infrastructure is built, we know that we have a reasonable level of expectation that there's going to be electrical wiring in most rooms. Right? Every, whenever you have a light uh, electrical outlet, you have to have another one that's six foot away, or you have to be three foot away from a bend. So those kind of things guarantee that we have this expectation that the tracking system, you're going to have wiring in most of these rooms. And so th that, that plays in our favor, because that kind of, uh, it, it, it gives us an idea of what it's going to look like, because they have to follow code uh, for a lot of these things. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Fire hazards are another thing. <coughs> yeah. Um, so with the sort of like event detection system with switches going on and mm -hmm. off, it seems like your reasoning system that you might build on top of that might look for the on and then say, oh, the refrigerator's in the on state, yep. and then look for the corresponding off right. event to say, okay, now it's off. Right. Um, what can you do to protect from like uh, missing some of those events? Say you get two ons from the fridge because you missed the off. Yeah. Uh, so what we do is, so we use another, so we use uh, multiple features there. So we use the uh, initial transient, and if it had a, a continuous noise signature, we'd have that. And at the same time, we get the current step function. So when you have an event, we know that this event has a rough correlation of this much power being consumed. And if we don't see the off event, what we do is we assume it turned off if we saw that kind of step later on. So there's a timeout window, essentially. So what we do is it times out if we don't see it. If we see an on event, or sorry, if we, see, if we catch the off event, we go back and try to find where the on is by looking at that step change. So sometimes you can't find it because it might be masked between a bunch of different events. Um, in that case, we, we don't find where it is. Yeah. yeah. Have you tried looking at sub-event detection? So I'm thinking like in a refrigerator, you've got the defrost cycle versus the compressor running versus the door opening and being able to detect each of those. Yeah, so for the refrigerator, we only do two right now, which is the uh, compressor and just the fridge door. Um, so the defrost, uh, so most of the fridges actually have a, uh, so it still has to, um, so all it does is it cuts the compressor off, right? It just turns it off for, for a significant period of time. So what we're looking at for that is looking at the periodic nature of it. Because it turns out um, a lot of the uh, refrigerators duty cycle at fairly per periodic intervals that you can predict. Um, because after a while, after a day or two, you kind of know how often the compressor is going to kick on and off. And so you know what state th that the refrigerator went into. So if we just know the door, event and just the compressor event, we can actually infer all the other events inside of it. But we're just looking at the main things, which is the compressor and the door. Um, if, we, if there are events that occur that, are, that we uh, don't have in our, our database or in our mind data, or if we don't train on it, it just gets cast, classified as an unknown event. So, uh, so, some, so somebody asked a question about, you know, let's say I plug a device in and move it to another location. So an example of this is you know, your MacBook's adapter. Those are actually very noisy devices. No matter where you plug it in, we're going to see it. And so, um, so we know where it is. We know that you plugged it in. Um, uh, we, we don't know where it is, but we know that you've plugged it in somewhere. And so we're able to see it uh, despite it being plugged in a different location because it's continuously noisy. But let's say you plug in something from Lenovo that we haven't learned at all. 
it'll identify it as potentially a power adapter because of the noise characteristic that, of the models that we have, but we won't know what it is. It'll just be unknown, but here's the, here's the estimated category for the device. Devices that are well known, whether it's dishwasher or refrigerator, you can identify the model. Yeah, I mean, we're not getting into that detail, but you could. But it turns out the model isn't that easy because they, they use the same, let's say you have a Samsung television, the 1080p 42 inch television. They use the same power supply for the 32 inch one, the 36 inch one, et cetera. So you can go to manufacturer, but I don't know about model. Yeah. So how might this sort of infrastructure based sensing interact with, with uh, you know, utility controlled demand? Right. So one of the things that we're, so we've uh, engaged with a variety of different utilities in the U.S. And one of the things that they're really interested in is now, in, so the typical model was to have a cutoff, sense, cutoff device that would turn off your air conditioning system in 5 p.m. every day. But what now, what they can now do is the human can be the actuator. So if they want to opt into a particular, that's kind of odd. Um, that's not good. That's not good. Is yeah, no, the refrigerator's calling me. Uh, that's a noise signature that we should leverage. Anyway, um, so what they, the, what they now can do is, because we know which devices they're using and how long they're using them, they can opt into it. So for example, if you have family over that week and you, do, you have to use your air conditioner, use it, right? We know that you opted out, but next week, let's say you turn your AC off every day at 5 p.m., we know that you didn't use it. So now we can do verification. So that, well, that was one of the concerns with the utility space was that they had to put an actuator in there because they could never verify it. Now you can just let the humans do what they want to do, where they control their, their infrastructure, but now we can verify if they opted out or opted into it. And okay. Let's go over here. Oh, sorry. Do we have time for a last question? Go ahead. Go ahead. So I have a question about privacy concerns. Yes, that's a great question. You are entering into people's you know, homes and monitoring. Yeah. yeah. How are you addressing certain privacy concerns and how this data could be yep, you know, totally. sold or used or whatnot? So one of, the, one of the nice things about this research agenda is there's a whole different other research agenda. You flip it upside down, and you can actually publish all this work in a security conference, right? Um, so, so, I'm wor so I'm working with uh, Yoshi Kono at, the, at UW, who's in the security space, where we're looking at all this data that we've mined to see what can you really infer with it if you didn't have this database or if you did have this database. Imagine what you can do with our power line interface module if you plug it into the outside of somebody's house, right? Oh, you have an Xbox. Oh, you have two televisions, right? So that's the thing. So we're looking at what kind of data can you really get out of that. So now what we're looking at is, well, are there ways that we can obfuscate the data over the power line so that you're the only one that can look at it? So the secret key here is your home. Your home actually has an interesting noise signature, which is actually fairly unique. You go to your neighbor's house, very different characteristic. So can we use your noise signature in your home as your secret key? So let's say the utility gets the data. They can't make any sense out of it until you get it back. And you, in your home, can see the data. So we're looking at a variety of different techniques where we can obfuscate it so that you're the only one that can really see the data. So we're actually exploring this pretty, uh, pretty aggressively right, right now. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.